Welcome to session 15 on thin walled pressure vessels. Today we're going to discuss the relationships between the internal pressure in a pressure vessel and the stresses in its walls. We'll discuss different types of pressure vessels, their uses, and also derive uh, these stress pressure relationships. And this image on the right kind of gives you an idea of what a pressure vessel might look like. This is a cylindrical one. It's elongated and it has capped ends. And one of the things we're attempting to avoid is catastrophic failure of pressure vessels. So if the material is not made thick enough for with, with enough strength or given uh, yield strength, for example, then the material may fail and you could have situations like you see here where uh, the, the gas or the liquid inside would escape and it could be kind of hazardous and dangerous for people around this device. After we describe these stress pressure relationships, we'll do some examples based on thin walled pressure vessels, and then we'll conclude with what is kind of a classic problem that describes how you would go about wrapping a composite material with um, filament at an, an appropriate angle. Okay, so if you're trying to, to wrap filament about a cylindrical pressure vessel like you see here, what angle should it should it be done? And you're like, oh, you can kind of look and see, oh, maybe I can estimate it. Well, yeah, yes, you can estimate it, but we can also derive what the optimal angle will be. But let's go ahead and continue with our first portion of this session. We are discussing pressure vessels, and they might be commonly used for storing fluids, gases, and liquids under pressure. And they might be useful in power plants, either nuclear or, or coal, right, or, or other forms. And in here, what you see is essentially the layout for what could be a power plant with some type of nuclear reactor. And in this reactor vessel right here, what you're seeing is the creation of steam from, from heat. And that is going to result in, in pressure that needs to be contained. So it's very important that these calculations are done carefully, obviously, so that there is not a catastrophic failure. There are standards out there to avoid failures in pressure vessels. So ASME and OSHA have some standards. And uh, we're not really going to go into the standards for our class, but we are going to describe kind of the, the very basics of, of how you would uh, appropriately size or appropriately choose a, a thickness for your pressure vessel. So um, there are essentially two types of pressure vessels. One is the cylindrical type and the other is the spherical type. So the cylindrical type, as you have already kind of seen and might guess, looks like a cylinder and there's some internal pressure inside. The result, if so if you rotate this and you're looking now at the pressure vessel from the side, is a set of stresses that are orthogonal to each other and they're tangent to the surface of the pressure vessel. So they're, they're running kind of in these two directions. And we'll go into detail in terms of what their magnitudes are, but the one that kind of goes around the cylindrical portion, like a hula hoop, that's what we call the hoop stress, okay, or the circumferential 
stress, so this sigma 1. And sigma 2 is what we would call the longitudinal stress. Spherical pressure vessels look like balls, and they do have a state of stress, also tangent to the surface. And what's different here is that because the ball or sphere is well, symmetric, I, mean, I can essentially rotate uh, the ball and I can look at a state of stress on the surface of this ball. The two orthogonal pairs that I have are going to be the same. Okay? And we'll also derive uh, expressions or an expression for this the sigma that you see there. Some characteristics of pressure vessels, well, they have thin walls. What does that mean? We say that the radius is 10 times greater than the thickness of the vessel. Are there pressure vessels that are not thin walled? Absolutely, but we are not going to discuss the derivations involved with calculating out um, what, the, uh, what the stresses in the walls would be if they're not thin. Okay, we're going to assume thin walls here. And another term to keep in mind is something called gauge pressure. And you're familiar with it. We often in this course will just represent it as a P. But this, is, this could also be represented as a delta P. This is not an absolute pressure, but it's the difference between the pressure inside the vessel and the pressure outside the vessel. And typically, the internal pressure is greater than the external pressure. Okay, so, you know, <clears throat> you have these pressure vessels that could be in the air in terms of the fuselage or kind of like the cylindrical fuselage of an airplane vehicle, right? And as you go higher and higher up, the surrounding pressure there's less atmosphere right acting down or acting on normal to the surfaces as you bring them higher and higher up in the air so there's going to be a lower pressure outside and if i keep the same pressure inside let's say i kept the inside atmospheric there's going to be a higher and higher difference in pressure between the inside and outside as i go up and the material doesn't really care what your elevation is or, or where you are, but it is going to care about a difference in pressure between what's inside and what's outside. And in contrast to gauge pressure, so we, we often think about gauge pressure, we have, we're thinking about these pressure differences, and, and delta P might be an, a better way to put it, but we're going to use P, that's what Hibbler uses as well. And this is in contrast to absolute pressure. So absolute pressure is kind of similar to what we think about when we're talking about um, pressure at sea level, okay? And that pressure is 101.3 kilopascals, all right? Nominally, uh, if you're at sea level. And again, this is kind of like going back to what we were saying. If you go higher and higher um, and there's less atmosphere above you, then kind of the absolute pressure that you're going to be feeling is going to be less. So let's let's start looking at the derivation uh, for the relationships between the hoop stress or the circumferential stress and the internal pressure or the the gauge pressure the the internal pressure. Um, so sometimes we just say, okay, this is the internal pressure, and we make this assumption that it's gauge pressure, or we make the assumption that um, the surrounding pressure would be zero, right? Which is uh, not often the case. In space, that would be a situation where, where it is the case. But we have a specified internal pressure, a specified internal gauge pressure. And... We're going to look at deriving both the hoop or circumferential stress and the longitudinal stress. Let's start, though, with the hoop or circumferential stress. So once again, here is 
the cylindrical pressure vessel with internal pressure P. And now we're going to kind of rotate just slightly, okay, so that now we're looking at this vessel longwise. So, you know, this is what we see. We just see this circular face here when we're looking at it. And what we're going to do is actually cut it in half. So now, essentially, you have this, 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 uh, well, uh, a hollow cylinder with, and you're looking at half. So it's like looking at like a moon of sorts. Okay. And we see, and so this, this, when we say, you know, <clears throat> these pressure vessels, I guess I should say, they have some thickness to them. I haven't really drawn that yet, right? These are just, and we're going to draw it. Like the next thing that we show is going to be with some thickness. And when we cut, what we're going to look at is the projection of this pressure that's acting normal to the surface into this this the sea like object okay and so we're going to project it into there right and so <coughs> excuse me what's the what's the area there well it's it's going to be kind of this height all right and then the depth into the page Right. And maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, right? But that this height is going to be the 2R okay, that you see here. What is going to keep this half of a cylinder from accelerating? Well, when we take a slice, this is like the method of sections. We're going to say that there's a, a force or a tension, okay? And it's acting over an area, and so that's going to be a stress that we can say that we have in the kind of top wall and in the bottom wall. Okay, so what are we talking about? Okay, so here now we finally show some thickness. So here is the pressure P acting on kind of this this you know semicircular portion on the interior surface. And that's being counteracted by these stresses and forces in the walls to keep things from accelerating in that direction. And we're going to call this, uh, this width here a dy. So now, when we look at uh, doing equilibrium, what, and so thickness is T, right? So this is kind of how thick the material is, and then we've we've taken this projection and we're now cutting um, a narrow, like, you know, a thin, a thin piece of it to have a dy. When we do equilibrium, what are we going to see? Well, we see that this sigma is acting over this area, right? And what is this area? Well, it's going to be the T times dy, okay? And there's going to be another one down here. So there are going to be two of them. Right? So that's going, they're both going to be acting in one direction, and that's acting in the opposite direction to this P. And that's acting over this 2R, right? R distance and R distance, also times dy. Okay, so this is what we have. Sigma 1 T dy, right, from maybe the top or the bottom, plus another sigma 1 T y, you know, or the bottom maybe. All right, we have two of them, and then... We're projecting that pressure into that, that surface that is going to have an area, a, a projected uh, cross-sectional area of twice the R and then the dy. So we do a little bit of algebra, right? In this case, we're combining uh, these two and we do a little bit more algebra we realize that, oh, we don't need the dy's anymore. And we don't need the twos anymore. And so what do we get? We get the following, that the sigma one in the wall is equal to this fairly simple expression, pr 
over 2t. Or I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Oops. PR over T. Okay, and this is the Hooper circumferential stress. Let's now look at the longitudinal or axial stress. So once again, we'll start with our cylindrical pressure vessel. And we're going to take a little bit of a different projection. In this case, okay, so last time we rotated it so that we were looking at this face. This time, what we're going to do is we're going to rotate it sideways so that this face is actually facing this direction. It's kind of into the, to, to the in, well, it's just facing to the right, this whole face right here, it's facing to the right. And then we're going to take a slice, okay, through the middle. So the area on this side is pi r squared. And we have these stresses, okay, we're going to call them sigma twos, that are acting along, you know, the cylinder. So that's a longitudinal, they're acting in a longitudinal direction. And they're acting in the ring around it, okay? So if we now give this uh, slice or cross-section uh, or, 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 or piece, you know, half of the, the the cylindrical pressure vessel, some thickness, and a little bit of perspective. What we see, we say, okay, well, this has thickness T in this direction. There's internal pressure P, and as we did last time, we're going to project that pressure onto this back surface, okay, onto this surface, okay. So that's going to be projected on the pi r squared area. And then what's kind of interesting is that that is going to be countered by a sigma 2 acting in this annular region, okay? So it's, it's like a ring, essentially, right? And we're going to say that that stress is, is being supported in that ring with some thickness. And the area of that ring, okay, we've discussed things like this before, is the circumference times the thickness, right? You're like, okay, you really want to do pi r squared outer minus pi r squared inner. Yes, that's that's true, okay? If it's thin enough, though, if the wall is thin, this is a very good approximation, okay? So we're going to use that, and that's going to make things a little bit simpler because, well, we're saying that the uh, thickness is, is one-tenth or less um, from the radius. So we do equilibrium here and we have this sigma 2 acting over this 2 pi r t area and it's countering this pressure which is acting over this pi r squared face here. So this is what we get for equilibrium. What do we see? We see that we can get rid of some pi. Uh, we can um, then write out this expression, and sigma 2 is equal to PR over 2T, right? So I accidentally said PR over 2T over here, but this is PR over T. Hoop stress, sigma 2 is PR over 2T. We'll talk about this more, but notice that the hoop stress is greater than the longitudinal stress. So this one, I mean, we, we are concerned about both of them, but this one is the one that we're typically going to be a little more concerned about because it's twice um, the stress in the directional orthogonal. And if you look at this diagram that I crudely drew, you see that I was making the sigma one have longer uh, vectors to represent the fact that this sigma one is larger than the sigma two. Let's move on to the derivation for the normal stresses in the thin walls of a spherical vessel. Okay, so now this is a ball, believe it or not, okay, with an internal pressure P uh, or a gauge pressure P, right? If there's a difference between the inside and the outside pressure. And what we have are sigma. These are the, sh the stresses that are 
acting orthogonal to each other and tangent to the um, uh, to the, the the sphere, the sphere surface. So now, what do we do? Well, once again, we take another slice, and this looks familiar. We did this one previously. We said that we had pressure. We project it on to this surface, and then we hear it's counterbalanced by a stress sigma acting on this annular region. Okay, and that has uh, thickness t. So for equilibrium, this one's pretty fast too, um, and very similar uh, to what we did when we were looking at the longitudinal stress in the cylinder. But this is a sphere, so we're projecting it onto this area, okay, which we can describe as pi r squared. So in the end, what do we get? Once again, we get p r over two t. Okay, and so this formula is one to write down, as are the ones we just described for hoop stress and longitudinal stress on a cylinder, on a cylindrical, thin-walled pressure vessel. So we essentially have three equations, and those are the major takeaways from this portion of the session, and they are also kind of the major takeaways for this uh, so this entire session, there will be some other things that we look at involving the Poisson ratio, but um, those these three equations are, are the most important. Now, bear with me as I talk about something that <laughs> is really a little bit close to me, all right? And that is how we can use this approach to describe the pressure drop across the wall of a bubble. So there is something called the Young-Laplace equation. And they typically write delta P. This is actually the same thing as the P that we've been writing, okay? But this is the pressure difference across the wall of a bubble. This term right here is a gamma, or it could be a sigma, actually. I didn't use sigma because that's confusing. This gamma, it's a sigma. this gamma is surface tension, which is not force per area, it's actually force per unit length, okay? Um, so surface tension can have units, well, I'll show you in a second, but uh, it's, it has some type of force per, per unit length. And this 1 over Rx and this 1 over Ry, what does this mean? So for the Young-Laplace equation, it's not assuming that the curvature is the same in both directions, okay? But for a spherical bubble, it is going to be the same. So essentially, you have twice, you have you would have two over r here, okay? If that's the radius of a sphere and you have a spherical bubble. You can have different shaped bubbles, right? And what it's saying is that the pressure difference between the inside and the outside is going to be dependent on this radius. So if the radius is really, really, really small, turns out the internal pressure, okay, is actually quite high. It's maybe a little bit counterintuitive, right? But if R goes down, this is a surface tension, then the, the pressure becomes quite large inside. So for a spherical bubble, we have that this gamma is equal to delta p r over 2. This looks very similar to what we just wrote. What's different? Since this is a surface tension or a line tension, okay, into like newtons per meter would be an example surface tension, we get rid of this, this t, right? This is newtons per meter squared, possibly, or some type of force per for length squared. If I multiply by t, then it comes out to be um, this this left side. If I took the t over and put it over here, then it would become similar to what we have with surface tension. It would be some type of force per length. For water, this surface tension is around 70 dynes per centimeter. That's maybe a little bit awkward unit. Um, so if you convert it, 
to newtons per meter. I may be a little bit more awkward because it's 0 0.072 newtons per meter. And if you convert it to energy per um, area, uh, that's another way to think of surface tension, then you, um, you, you have the same uh, number uh, in front of it, 0 0.07. Okay? So why are these calculations, kind of FYI, FYI calculations, near and dear to me? Well, um, I spent time... Uh, I'm gonna actually I'm gonna jump this and then we'll come back to this because I want I want to share this okay so I spent time as a graduate student thinking about bubbles quite a bit all right um, what we were trying to do I don't know if you can see it very clearly I had to zoom in here actually I can zoom in uh, can't I all right so um, if you look here, you see all these specks. These are actually bubbles that were caught in this piece of transparent rubber. This is silicone. And the goal is to get pieces of silicone if you're, if, that we were trying to manufacture or manufacture to be free of bubbles. Okay. So I worked on a process and built some equipment with other people to be able to put in some inserts, some molds, collect some polydimethylsiloxane, which is uh, silicone rubber, and then spin at, say, thousands of revolutions per minute to work the bubbles out of this enclosed cavity. And there were a couple of mechanisms for the removal of bubbles. One is buoyancy. Okay, so bubbles, they like to go against gravity. And what's kind of fun is that when you're spinning, right, you create this, this very high um, gravity proportional to the spin speed and, and radius um, that is acting outward. So the bubbles actually, they move inward, okay? And then the other mechanism is dissolution. So the bubbles can actually dissolve into the liquid. And they actually, it competes, because the larger the bubble is, the more buoyancy it has for a given amount of drag and surface area. And so the bigger bubbles, they move really fast. It's the small bubbles that are difficult. And what I kind of went through and, and showed is that there are bubbles of a critical size that are kind of the pesky ones that are very difficult to remove. So uh, if you're interested, you can take a look at uh, some of the work. I had an opportunity to, to I guess, produce when I was a, when I was a graduate student. And um, this video, though, kind of gives you an overview of the process. So I had just shot some silicone into this mold that I'm now putting in a centrifuge that was enclosed by bulletproof uh, uh, polycarbonate or acrylic. I can't remember. Okay, and now what we're doing is we're actually looking at... I'm just going to stop it for a second. We... This was not the mold, but this is a this is the the mold I was showing was actually a metal mold, okay? But I also used molds that were transparent on top, okay? That that had machines, especially so that we could use a high speed camera to look through uh, that uh, bulletproof container, <laughs> okay? And then into the um, into the mold itself, okay? And there's light, and there's a high-speed camera, and what you're seeing is the startup, okay? So this is starting to rotate. The liquid had been deposited inside in, near the middle, and now it's moving out, okay, to the outer edges because it's spinning. So as it spins... Okay, five seconds later, you can see many of the bubbles 
have departed. Now, this is a zoomed in perspective. So now we're looking at a portion of that spinning disk. And what do we see? We see these enormous bubbles that they, they moved really fast. They got out, right? That's just the, the liquid essentially folding over itself. And the, the larger bubbles uh, are not the problem. It's the smaller bubbles that were harder to get out. Now, if you're making a part, what you can do with silicone oil, um, well, it's a silicone polymer, a uh, thermosetting silicone, is you can heat it up uh, to be able to accelerate the, the curing process. Now, there are some implications with thermal uh, contraction um, and some, potentially some non-uniformities there, and that was actually someone else's thesis <laughs> to look at. But once we've spun for a sufficient amount of time, we're able to essentially assure ourselves that we've got the large bubbles out and there's enough pressure to drive the really small ones in to the liquid. And there are some that the most pesky ones are kind of these ones that are critical size that they're traveling and they don't dissolve or they don't disappear until like they get right to the liquid air interface in the middle. It's kind of interesting, right? That this thing is spinning and the bubbles are moving towards the middle and you want to get them out of the region of interest. Okay, so like here, this is the region of interest and I'm sorry, here this is like the area, the wasted area. Okay, and so yes, that's what I spent um, a couple years of my life looking at uh, trying to understand how to remove these, these bubbles. Okay. So thank you for bearing with me. So these bubbles are, uh, are, are are near and dear to me. And so I just wanted to make the parallel between these pressure vessels and bubbles. And, and that turns out that pressure, the bubbles are uh, fantastic uh, pressure vessels. And as the radius decreases, the surface tension causes the pressure to increase. Okay, so we've been talking about sigma 1 and sigma 2. These are stresses that are tangent okay, to the, the surface of the, the cylindrical vessel. And the hoop stress is larger than the circumferential, I mean the hoop stress or circumferential stress is sigma 1 and is larger than the longitudinal stress sigma 2. But maybe you're asking, well, what about a stress in the radial direction? Why isn't there stress not coming out radially? Okay, from the, the inside of the pressure vessel. Like, so, you know, we're talking like, why, what happens in this direction? Well, uh, David Roylance has a nice, succinct way to describe this. He says, essentially, that the radial components of stress, he was using a different term there, vanish at the surfaces because there are no forces acting externally in that direction to balance them. Okay, so there's essentially no, uh, there's no, there's no stress uh, out here because there's no pressure. It's, you know, we're saying there's a difference. You know, this is zero. This is the internal pressure. The, you know, this is P is some type of gauge pressure. Um, so they don't, and these components do not have sufficient specimen distance. Okay, that's a cool term, specimen distance. They don't have enough uh, thickness, essentially, in the thin through thickness dimension to build up appreciable levels. So, yes, there could be pressure here but they don't have enough thickness to get to significantly high levels, all right? So, you know, you have maybe maybe here, like right on the inside surface, you could say that sigma 3 is equal to P, all right? Uh, but it, it doesn't, uh, but over here, it's, it's, it's essentially zero right outside, okay? So that's one way to think about it. So there's just very little uh, stress that can build up. The other way, you know, to think about this is, well, what if it were this P on the inside? Like what if just through the thickness it were all the internal pressure right in here? You know, pressure has units of force per area and uh, stress has a units of force per area, right? So what if it were P? Well, guess what? We have this assumption for thin walled pressure vessels that R over T, right? That the radius is 
10 times or greater than the thickness. So if we look at r over t over here, right? Or r over t over here, r over 2t, sorry, over here. This is a factor of 10 or a factor of 5. So another way to kind of think about this is these pressures or stresses, sorry, sigma 1 to sigma 2 are much higher. You know, in this case, if it's sigma 1, like 10 times higher than what the internal pressure would be. And so it also kind of is a case for why we can ignore this, um, this pressure, all right, or this, this stress in this radial direction, all right, or like a sigma 3 direction here. Okay, so here are some thoughts on, on thin-walled pressure vessels to keep in mind that the hoop or circumferential stress is twice as large as the longitudinal stress. I don't know how many times I've said that now. <laughs> Um, yes, cylindrical vessels are more common than spherical vessels, and I didn't mention this initially. Um, why is that? And it has to do with manufacturing, uh, if, and also some practical purposes, right? If I'm taking a big tank down the road, okay, on the back of a trailer or a trailer's pulling this big tank, right? What's going to be efficient in terms of being able to get a lot of volume? Uh, well, I could try to like make one big sphere, but that doesn't fit within a lane of a road, for example. So uh, that's maybe a practical reason why you're going to use a cylindrical one instead of a spherical one. But also for, manu for manufacturing purposes, it is typically hard to make a sphere, to machine a sphere, or to uh, mold uh, or uh, sheet form a sphere, okay? So you could take a sheet of metal and you can, uh, you can kind of wrap it around itself and then you can weld ends on that, on that, uh, on that uh, hollow cylinder, okay? Uh, so from a manufacturing perspective, uh, Cylindrical pressure vessels are, are usually more straightforward. And so even though the hoop circumferential stress is twice as large as the longitudinal stress, okay, because of, for, because of the practicality of cylindrical pressure vessels, we're often going to use them, even if we, we know that we're going to have to deal with twice the, the stress. Um, spherical pressure vessels, uh, there's symmetry. So we have symmetry, which eliminates the difference between longitudinal and hoop stress. We just have essentially equivalent of the longitudinal stress in the, in the cylindrical pressure vessel. And it's also kind of fun to think about spheres in terms of uh, minimizing the ratio of surface area to volume. So if you do, I mean, um, we do have spherical pressure vessels and if it's a situation where you're trying to use as little material as possible, right, or trying to keep something pretty light, okay, then a sphere is a, is a great way to, to proceed, okay, but there's gonna, probably going to be some higher manufacturing costs associated um, with them uh, as opposed to using the cylindrical ones, okay. So this information, these three equations are two, uh, but you know, these three equations are enough to start to actually do some degree of design on pressure vessels. So that's what question one asks. If we are designing a spherical pressure vessel okay, with an internal volume of V, what thickness T would be necessary to support a pressure P if the maximum axial tolerable stress is some yield strain? Okay. So you get an opportunity, we get an opportunity to, to think about this and um, come back for the second portion in a little bit. Thank you.